everyone. This is our first uh, episode of the medical lecture series. And this program has been provided to us by a grant. And I'll have our librarian, Chelsea Neary, to introduce the program and the physician for tonight. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. And welcome to Diabetes and Thyroid with Dr. Sanal Pathak. Um, before we begin, just a couple reminders. First, please keep your microphone muted during the presentation, and that will help cut down on any background noise that we have during the presentation. Also, please hold your questions until the very end, and then type them in the chat box when you're ready to ask them. Now, we will be providing closed captioning this evening um, in both English and Spanish. For English captions, you're going to click on the closed caption icon. And for the Spanish captions, I'm gonna have you put the link in the chat box. Let me put that in the chat box right now, for everyone. All right, so if you need Spanish captions, you're gonna click on the link that I just placed in the chat box. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Sonal Pata. She is an endo endocrinologist practicing in North Bergen, New Jersey. She completed her fellowship in, endo in endocrinology at Nassau University Medical Center in New York. She is board certified in endocrinology as well as obesity medicine. She has a special interest in diabetes, thyroid, parathyroid, pituitary, and adrenal disorders. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Patha. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. It's my pleasure to be here. Ali, can you uh, start the presentation, the PowerPoint? Is that good? Uh, yes, thank you. No problem. And next, all right. So t in today's talk, we will talk mainly about diabetes, the different types, what's the disease burden in our country, uh, potential complications and treatment. And we'll try to briefly also cover uh, some thyroid uh, topics, the most common one being hypothyroidism. Next slide, please. All right, so this slide just presents uh, what is the burden of diabetes in our country as a snapshot. Um, about 30 million people in America I know the slide says 29.1, but the latest figures are actually at 30 uh, million people who have diabetes. That's about one out of every 11 person in this country has diabetes. What's even more surprising is that one out of four of these do not even know that they are diabetics. Next, please. Um, two out of every five Americans are expected to develop type two diabetes in their lifetime. So that's a very alarming uh, figure. Next, please. And like I said, uh, out of those 30.3 million, one in four does not, they're not even aware that they're diabetics. Next, please. So uh, pre-diabetes now, that's the precursor to diabetes. Uh, and look at the numbers for that. 86 million people in this country have prediabetes. That's more than one in out of every three adults. And look at this number next to it. Nine out of 10 prediabetics are not aware that they have prediabetes. So they go about their normal life being blissfully unaware that you know they have something that's brewing in their bodies. Uh, out of these 86 million pre-diabetics, if they do nothing, uh, they don't follow any lifestyle changes, they don't lose weight, they don't increase their physical activity level, about 15 to 30 percent of them are going to go on to develop type 2 diabetes within the next five years. Next, please. So this is just summing that up. Uh, so blood sugar levels basically are higher than what is considered normal, but it is not high enough to be called diabetes yet. That's what we call prediabetes. And about 85 million or one in three Americans are 
pre-diabetic at present. Next, please. Um, now, one in three adults with diabetes and one in five adults with high blood pressure may have chronic kidney disease. So what this slide tells us is that when you have diabetes, your risk of developing kidney disease is even higher than somebody who has high blood pressure. So it's the leading cause of chronic kidney disease in the country. Next slide, please. So this map tells us where is, how is diabetes uh, distributed in this country? So if you see by the colors on the map, the darkest red or the maroon color are the, peop are the states where the prevalence of diabetes is more than 12%. Uh, excuse me one second. <clears throat> And uh, if you look at the lightest pink color, that's where the least prevalent uh, diabetes is noted. So if you notice Alabama, uh, uh, South Carolina, these are the states, West Virginia, where almost 15% of population has diabetes. Uh, next slide, please. So summarizing uh, what we talked about before also and why we care so much about you know, how much diabetes is rampant in this country. So it's the leading cause of new blindness among adults. It's the leading cause of kidney failure in America. It's the leading cause of non-traumatic lower limb amputations, meaning if you're in an accident and you lose a limb due to that, that's another story. But short of an accident, the most common cause of people having amputations of their uh, legs uh, is diabetes. Uh, your risk of heart disease stroke is almost doubled if you are a diabetic. It's considered the seventh leading cause of death and mortality rates, uh, that's the death rate, is two to four times higher uh, than non-diabetic people of the same age in patients who have diabetes due to all these complications from it. Next slide, please. So, Another sum, summation uh, slide is, you know, like we talked about, 30.3 million, big number. One out of four doesn't know they have it. Seventh leading cause of death, number one cause of kidney failure, number one cause of amputations, number one cause of blindness in adults. And uh, in the last 20 years, the number of people who've been diagnosed with diabetes has doubled. So, you know, the situation going forward for our future really needs, uh, you know, a big change. Uh, in our perspective. Next slide, please. So why uh, is diabetes such an epidemic? So it's thought that it's obesity, which is fueling this. Uh, if the current you know, trend persists, almost one in three people will be obese by the year 2034. And one in 10 people will develop diabetes. So the number currently is one in 11, and this is gonna become one in 10 going uh, into the future. So unless we stop the epidemic of obesity, uh, stopping diabetes is gonna be hard. Um, next slide, please. So what happens when we eat? Uh, as everybody knows, really, you know, with diabetes, you have to, everybody says you got to watch your diet and, you know, watch what you're eating. So what happens when you eat? So when you eat, food enters your intestines. Most of this food is converted into glucose, which is really the end product. And this is also the body's main source of energy. So everybody needs glucose in your blood. All your body cells and organs need glucose to work because it's the main source of energy. So what happens in diabetes? Let's see. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So uh, when food goes down your intestines and stomach, you know, it gets digested. So which are the foods that get converted into sugar? It's the carbohydrates. And carbohydrates converted into sugar or glucose, and this enters the bloodstream. Your pancreas, which is the organ that produces insulin, it is released as soon as the body senses that sugar is coming. And insulin, the job of it is to move the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it's gonna be used as fuel. Uh, so which are the organs that use? Muscles need it, 
Some of the, the remaining sugar is moved into the liver where it's stored as glycogen uh, and so forth. Uh, next slide. So when somebody does not have diabetes, uh, the sugar is maintained in a tight range uh, with what is considered a healthy range. So uh, who, what is the main uh, driver for this? It's insulin. So pancreas will produce insulin as soon as the food is entering the bloodstream or any condition that causes high, like somebody gets a glucose infusion or a drip, pancreas is gonna produce insulin at the right time and the right amount. And it's gonna drive the extra glucose from the bloodstream into the cells and maintain always the sugar in the optimal range. So this is in a person who does not have diabetes. Let's see what happens if you have diabetes. Next slide, please. So when you do have diabetes, the blood sugars uh, in the blood, uh, the glucose level in the blood is not maintained in the normal level and it's elevated, it's high. So why is that? It could be to, you know, a few different reasons. One is that your pancreas is just not producing enough insulin anymore. Uh, another reason can be that pancreas is producing insulin, but your body cells are unable to utilize that glucose uh, the insulin, which is driving the sugar into the blood cells, that process is not happening very well. Or the third thing will be sugar is stored in liver as glycogen. And overnight when you're not eating, the liver produces some sugar to maintain the glucose levels normal. And maybe the liver is putting out too much sugar in your bloodstream. So these are some of the potential causes. Next slide, please. So what is a diabetic blood sugar number? When you have diabetes, what it means is that if your blood sugar is above 125 fasting, so when you wake up in the morning after at least a 10 hour fast, if your sugar at that time is more than 125, it's called diabetes. The second number we look at is called A1C. So this is a test that tells us what your average sugars have been for the last three months. And this number, if it's above 6.4, that's in the diabetic range. So these are two tests that are done in labs by your doctor, which will tell us you know, whether you have diabetes or not. The second thing will be pre-diabetes. So if your sugar is maintained between 100 to 125 in the fasting state, that's labeled as a pre-diabetic range. And the A1C range for pre-diabetes is between 5.7 to 6.4. Again, this is a test that can be easily ordered by your doctor in your labs, and uh, this way you can be screened for prediabetes or diabetes. So what is normal? So normal is your blood sugar should always be maintained at less than 100 fasting when you wake up in the morning. Uh, no matter what you had, even if you had ice cream the night before, the body's regulatory mechanisms are so efficient that your blood sugar will always be maintained under 100 if you're not a diabetic or you do not have the tendency to be pre-diabetic. And your hemoglobin A1C, that's the second number, will always be maintained at under 5.7%. Next slide, please. So this is another way of summarizing the same thing. Normal, uh, the green values are an A1C below 5.7%, a fasting blood sugar of 99 or less, and glucose tolerance test is the third way of diagnosing diabetes and prediabetes. Not done very commonly in which your, if your doctor orders, this is a test in which you're gonna go to the lab, they're gonna check your sugar, and they will give you a drink with uh, glucose in it. It's commonly done when a woman is pregnant, but it can also be done for diabetics uh, otherwise as well. And then they check your sugar two hours after having the soda. So the two hour after number, if it's between 140 to 140, 140 to 199, that's pre-diabetic range. Usually, normally, it's maintained under 140. And the pre-diabetic and diabetic numbers we had talked about before, for the glucose tolerance test, if your sugar is above 200, that's diagnosis diabetes for you on that test. Next slide, please. So we, I'm sure everybody's heard that, you know, I have type one diabetes or I have type two diabetes, people talk like that. So what does that mean? 
So type 1 diabetes is when your pancreas is not producing insulin. So there's an absolute lack or deficiency of insulin, which causes the blood sugar levels to get dangerously high. Um, type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, your pancreas is still working, uh, but it's just not working efficiently enough. That's one reason of type 2 diabetes. The other cause can be that, yes, the pancreas is still healthy and producing insulin, but your body is resistant to insulin and it, it, or it's not using the insulin efficiently. So let's look at the next slide for more details on this. So this is another summarization of the different types of diabetes. Uh, type one, like I said, type two, gestational diabetes. We will briefly touch over this topic as well. This is diabetes that uh, uh, happens in a pregnant woman and prediabetes. Okay, next slide, please. So type one diabetes, pancreas makes little or you know, eventually no insulin at all. And type 2 diabetes, where either cells are not able to use that insulin that your body's making well, what's called insulin resistance, uh, or that, you know, slowly over the course of years, as, you know, everybody who gets diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, as years go by, your pancreas becomes less and less efficient in making insulin, and the amount produced may decrease as well. So that's the two ways you get type 2 diabetes. Uh, next slide. Uh, what are some of the symptoms of diabetes? Diabetes is called a silent killer because when your sugars are in the pre-diabetic range or in early diabetic range, meaning your sugars are high enough to be labeled as diabetes, but not very high, most people will have no symptoms at all. Uh, when the sugars are chronically above 180 to 200 range, these are some of the symptoms you will notice. Uh, most common being frequent urination, unusual thirst, uh, change in appetite, losing weight, uh, feeling tired, uh, some tingling or numbness in your hands and feet, and blurry vision. Those are can be some of the symptoms when your sugars are above a certain level for a few days or weeks. Next, please. So again, you know, uh, another way of saying you feel tired, you know, frequent urination, uh, weight loss. Now, even though a person with diabetes, which is uncontrolled, is losing weight, this is not a healthy weight loss. The weight loss that happens with uncontrolled diabetes is really you're losing water because you're getting dehydrated and your muscle is getting broken down. So this is not really fat loss that happens. Uh, poor wound healing, meaning you get any infection or you get you know, a cut or uh, any kind of wound, it's not going to heal in a timely manner. Uh, blurry vision, some sexual dysfunction can happen. Women may notice, you know, more frequent infections, either urinary tract infections or vaginal fungal infections and so forth. Um, let's uh, look at the next slide, please. So let's talk uh, about type 1 diabetes in a little bit more detail. Uh, one in 20 people with diabetes will have type 1 diabetes. So it's the less common or more rarer type of diabetes. And uh, most of the people who get diagnosed with type 1 di diabetes are either children or young adults, and you know, majority of them under age 20. And like we talked about before, here your body cannot make insulin at all. And you, these people are dependent on insulin for their life. Uh, the only treatment for type 1 diabetes, in addition to just, you know, watching your diet and uh, taking, monitoring your sugars and stuff is insulin. These people depend on insulin for their lives because if they don't inject insulin, uh, they can have a life-threatening complication. Next slide. So also known as juvenile diabetes, like I said, usually diagnosed in children and young adult. And now what causes your pancreas to quit making insulin? Uh, the most common theory that is proposed for this is that your immune system is making some antibodies, chemicals called antibodies, which attack the pancreas and they destroy the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin called the beta cells. 
So because of this immune mediated destruction, uh, your, your pancreas is not able to produce insulin anymore. Only 5% of total diabetics are the type one type. Most of the most common type of diabetes is type two. Uh, it's not preventable because really, you know, there's no way to regulate the immune system, you know, dysfunction that happens and that causes this disease. Uh, some other theories about what may cause this disease is either viral infections or certain, you know, people say that lack of sunlight, uh, you know, and, and so forth. These are the some of the proposed mechanisms, but really the most common uh, theory remains that it's your immune system which has caused the destruction in the pancreas. Next slide. So symptoms in type 1 diabetes start very abruptly. So this is also very different from type 2 diabetes in which, like we talked about before, if your sugars are only mildly high, you actually have no symptoms at all. And then if they start going high again, you will get the increased thirst and so forth. But in type 1 diabetics, they usually have a very dramatic presentation. So you will have a child that presents with uh, severe pain in their belly, uh, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, and you know you go to the emergency room and the sugar is noted to be high. Acids are you know ketones and acids build up in the blood and so forth. Uh, they may have had you know weight loss and some you know feeling tired, increased thirst, increased urination in the day or two before this, but usually it's a very dramatic presentation with some nausea, vomiting, and so forth in most type 1 diabetics. And they will usually need to be admitted to the hospital at this time. And then eventually started on insulin injections. Next slide. So how do you manage type 1 diabetes? Of course, checking your blood sugars, educating patients that you absolutely cannot skip insulin. You have to take insulin and all the doses in a timely manner when you have this, making the right food choices, avoiding high sugar foods, high carbohydrate foods, which are going to make the sugar even higher than usual, having an active lifestyle. And of course, the mainstay is insulin. Next slide. So before we had insulin, children who developed type 1 diabetes would just waste away and unfortunately, you know, die from this. And uh, eventually, you know, in 1921, a Canadian scientist developed insulin. And, you know, as soon as, you know, it was administered to the ward with these sick children, you know, they found that, you know, children got healthier, they gained weight and uh, such a dramatic improvement. So this, I think of the last century, insulin has to be one of the most significant discoveries uh, for sure. Next slide. So talking a little bit about type two diabetes, more than 90% of actual diabetic cases are type two diabetics. Here, your body or your pancreas is producing insulin, like I said, uh, but your body is not using it efficiently or properly. So the glucose under the effect of insulin is not moving into the cells and the sugar starts you know, being building up in the bloodstream. Uh, symptoms, initially, when you have only mildly high sugar, no symptoms. When, they, when you do start noticing that you know, you're having you know, frequent urination, you're you know, thirsty all the time, mouth is dry. A lot of people don't realize that this could be diabetes and they just ignore it. And um, it's also called adult onset or non-insulin dependent diabetes, although they are not the correct nomenclature for this. Type two diabetes is how this should be labeled. It can happen at any age, used to be only adults, but because obesity is so common these days in children and teenagers, uh, it's being diagnosed in teenagers as well. Next slide. So most people commonly are above age 40 when they're diagnosed, but uh, as I said, it's becoming very common in children and teenagers as well due to obesity. Uh, it's very common, what are the risk factors or what are the people who are prone to get type two diabetes? So if, you have, if you're overweight, uh, non-Caucasian races are more at risk to develop diabetes. If 
diabetes runs in your family. You know, those are all very high risk factors for you developing type two diabetes. Next slide. So being overweight, if you're not physically active and need a sedentary lifestyle, if there's family history of diabetes, for women especially, if they had gestational diabetes during their pregnancy, that's a very big risk factor for them developing type two diabetes uh, after pregnancy. And your risk goes up as you age. Uh, and we talked about non-Caucasian races being more at risk and uh, especially African-American people, Hispanic and Latinos, Native American uh, and Asian Americans. Next slide. This is uh, another way to summarize this, family history, being overweight, inactive lifestyle, other conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, which coexists with diabetes. If you have those, your chance of also becoming a diabetic is high. And again, if you're a woman and you had gestational diabetes during pregnancy, your risk of developing type two diabetes is high. If you are diagnosed with prediabetes, that's another risk factor for developing type two diabetes. Uh, next slide. So what are the symptoms? As we talked about before, usually they're very subtle and in early stages, there may be no symptoms at all, but eventually as your sugars start being very high, uh, you'll notice increased thirst, increased urination, feeling tired, blurry vision, frequent infections, your wounds not healing very well and so forth. Uh, one in four people with type two diabetes that we had said don't know they have it. And that's because the symptoms are so, subtle and non-specific. Uh, next slide. Okay. So treatment for type 2 diabetes. So let's see. Uh, you Every diabetic, type 1 or type 2, when they get diagnosed, should attend a diabetes education course. Uh, these are, you know, things that are covered by your insurance. So your doctor should always refer you for a diabetes education class, in addition to teaching you about diabetes in the office. Uh, education should also include about healthy eating. Uh, everybody should see a dietitian when they get diagnosed with diabetes so that they can, you know, learn about which foods to avoid, which foods to incorporate in their diet. Most important part uh, also is checking, learning how to check your sugars, increasing your physical activity, and then your doctor may give you various medications, which may include pills or insulin, uh, or both in type 2 diabetes. Next slide. Uh, let's talk briefly about gestational diabetes. This is diabetes that gets diagnosed during pregnancy. Uh, who are the women who have risk for gestational diabetes. These are uh, people who already have family history of diabetes in their family. Uh, they're overweight prior to pregnancy or gain a lot of weight during pregnancy. Uh, if you have gestational diabetes, your risk for developing type 2 diabetes is very high. Uh, the statistics say 18 out of every 100 pregnant uh, females will develop gestational diabetes. Uh, what happens in gestational diabetes is that your uh, baby becomes very large, uh, so uh, which can lead to you needing preterm, you know, uh, either you know, early labor or a C-section before uh, 40 weeks, just because the baby's size is too big. And having a large for size baby also can be used as a prediction for developing diabetes in the mother. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you monitor diabetes? Uh, this is uh, what's called a glucometer. Uh, you use a little device called a Lansing device, which comes with your glucometer. You prick your finger with that. A little drop of blood is put in the test strip, which is inserted into the sugar meter, and it gives you your blood sugar reading. So what are the numbers we are looking for? Normal, of course, as we said, is between 70 to 100 fasting and two hours after meal, no, no more than 140. If you're pre-diabetic, it's actually 100 to 125, not 101 to 125 fasting and 140 to 200 after meals. And a diabetic person will have more than 125 and more than 200 blood sugars respectively. Next slide. 
So if you don't keep your diabetes in control, what happens? Uh, why do we care so much about managing diabetes? It's because there's really not an organ in your body which is not affected from diabetes. Um, as you can see, uh, it's, you, know, you can get infections or wounds in your feet that won't heal because your sugars are high, leading to amputations, heart disease. Diabetes is considered a heart disease equivalent. So if you're labeled, uh, as having diabetes, you're labeled as having some degree of heart disease already. Damaged blood vessels in the retina, which is in your eyes, causing blindness, kidney failure, stroke, uh, nerve damage, causing neuropathy, which can be very painful, uh, and so forth. Next slide. So we talked about all the scary things. So you know, what can you do to minimize some of these risks and complications? So it is definitely true that you can prevent diabetes if you fall in one of the categories of people who are at high risk for developing diabetes. And like we talked about, these are people who are overweight, people who are not active, people who have family history of diabetes, or women who had gestational diabetes and so forth. So if you start following a healthy diet, start exercising, lose some weight, uh, you may reduce uh, your chance of becoming a diabetic or at least delay the start of diabetes by many years. Now, if you do develop diabetes, can you prevent some of the complications that we just talked about? Absolutely. If you keep your diabetes very well controlled, uh, the chance of complications is very low. So this is by maintaining good blood sugar control, maintaining a good blood pressure control, keeping your cholesterol in a healthy level for a diabetic, keeping up with your doctor's appointments, and of course, seeing various specialists and your doctor, you know, screening you for complications from diabetes so that if you do develop any complications, they can be detected early and treated early. Uh, next slide. So what, are, what can you do to lower your risk of complications? Maintaining an A1C, remember that's the number or the blood test, which tells what your three month average blood sugar is like. And this can be checked by your doctor and usually is routinely checked every three months in diabetic patients. So keeping this number at least 7% or less is one target. Maintaining your blood pressure at least under 140 over 80. Uh, and in some patients, less than 130 over 80 uh, is another target. Cholesterol bad cholesterol, what is called the LDL cholesterol, maintaining that under 100. And actually the latest guidelines uh, recommend maintaining the LDL 70 or less uh, and using statin. These are you know, medications like simvastatin, atorvastatin, different types of cholesterol lowering medications. Um, they are standard of care for diabetics to prevent heart disease and stroke. If you smoke, you should quit smoking, uh, increase physical activity, start exercising, following a healthy diet, taking care of feet so that, you know, if you develop any cuts or infections, you can take care of, you know, your feet in a timely manner so the infection doesn't get so bad that you need amputations, uh, getting your eyes uh, checked by an ophthalmologist every year, seeing the podiatrist for your feet uh, regularly, and so forth. Next slide. Uh, we talked about type 2 diabetes and how you prevent getting it or complications from it. With type 1, uh, unfortunately, it cannot be prevented right now. Uh, a lot of research is being done because this is uh, supposedly an immune-mediated you know, disease they're looking to develop. Can we modify your immune system so that it doesn't attack your pancreas? Could a vaccine be made, it, made for type 1 diabetes? But as of right now, we really don't have any way of preventing it. Uh, when, you know, if you do get diagnosed with it, you can prevent complications by maintaining your blood sugar levels in a very you know, healthy range and using your insulin injections regularly. Uh, islet cell transplantation, that's a surgical procedure where you know, it's like a pancreatic transplant. That's another you know, thing that's uh, sometimes done. Next slide. Type two, um, we, we talked about this healthy lifestyle. Uh, make sure that you're getting your labs done at a regular interval, making changes with your diet, maintaining your A1C 7% or less, 
um, exercising senior specialists like the eye doctor, the foot doctor, and so forth. Next slide. Can you prevent prediabetes or can you prevent prediabetics from progressing into diabetes? Uh, diabetes prevention program was a large scale study that was done in the 1990s uh, to look at this. Uh, like how, what can we do with pre-diabetic patients so that they don't go on to become diabetics? So half the patients were, you know, divided, they were divided into two groups. One group got treated with a diabetic medication called metformin. And the second group was treated with lifestyle changes, meaning they were just put on strict diet and exercise. So when they followed these patients over the course of a few years, they noticed that patients who followed the lifestyle changes, meaning they went on a strict diet, they started exercising, they lost weight, they were able to prevent diabetes by 58% compared to 31% who took the diabetic medication. So what this tells us is that there's nothing better than a healthy diet and uh, exercise uh, to prevent you know, getting prediabetes or if you have prediabetes from progressing to diabetes. And if you've got diabetes, then maintaining your diabetes in a really good range. Next slide. Gestational diabetes, uh, that can also be prevented. If women uh, you know, lose some weight and get their you know, body weight in a healthy range prior to pregnancy, their risk for developing gestational diabetes goes down significantly. If they did develop gestational diabetes, then losing the weight they gained during pregnancy in a you know, timely manner and making a change in their lifestyle will prevent them from becoming diabetic in the future increase in fiber in their diet during pregnancy, also reduce the risk of gestational diabetes significantly. Next slide. So what is a diabetic diet? Since we talked about uh, so much that you know it can make such a big impact. So what is this diet? So diabetic diet is something that's low in carbohydrate content. Uh, and what are carbohydrates? So carbohydrates is a food group uh, which when it's broken down and digested, gets converted into glucose. And there's different types of carbohydrates, so not all carbohydrates are bad. Uh, one should prefer complex carbohydrates over simple carbohydrates. So what are complex versus simple carbohydrates? So simple carbohydrates are something like sugar, white, uh, white flour, white rice, uh, juice, stuff like that, versus complex carbohydrates are whole grain, uh, whole grain breads, whole, you know, brown rice, um, having sweet potato versus potato. Uh, so more fiber rich uh, or carbohydrates that take your body a little longer to digest. Those are healthier. So like I said, they're high in fiber and also please incorporate non-starchy vegetables in your diet and lean protein and healthy fats as well. Next slide. So these are some of the you know, examples of carbohydrates. So as you can see, breads, pasta, grains, rice, uh, and so forth. So you can even see quinoa in there. So quinoa is a complex carbohydrate and a healthier carbohydrate. And of course, the brown breads are healthier than the white bread in there. Next slide. So these are fruits and vegetable examples of carbohydrates. So not all vegetables are healthy. So if you can see plantain, um, these starchy vegetables like, you know, malanga, batata, and all those things, potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, peas, uh, green peas, when they're cooked, they are pretty starchy. So starchy vegetables are high in carbohydrates. Fruits are high in carbohydrates. Next slide. So what are the vegetables which are good for you then, which won't raise your blood sugar so much? So these are some of the examples, cucumbers, tomatoes, broccoli, onions, mushrooms, bell pepper, lettuce, cauliflower, um, squashes of different kind, green beans, celery, etc. Next slide. So what is a diabetic plate. So this is called the plate method. So if you're trying to figure out what should be the proportion of different foods in your, uh, in your you know, plate, uh, 
half the plate should be non-starchy vegetables. One quarter should be your carbohydrate, which can be any of these examples that we just talked about. And the other quarter should be a lean protein. Next slide. So some of the, we'll look at some of the examples of uh, a healthy diabetic plate. So here you have a quarter plate with lean chicken, a quarter plate with mashed potatoes, that's your starch, uh, and the uh, half of the plate is non-starchy vegetables like green beans. Next slide. Another example, so here there's a quarter plate of meat, a quarter plate of carbohydrate, which is the tortillas here, and half the plate is salad. Next slide. So this is another example, rice and beans in one quarter of the plate, chicken in another quarter, and then salad or other you know, kind of vegetables in the rest of the plate. Next slide. Another slide, you know, here, uh, beans as a quarter, meat as another quarter, and again, non-starchy vegetables as half the plate. Let's see the next slide. Okay. So the fruits and vegetables and uh, different things that have carbohydrates, uh, if you go towards the right-hand side of the you know, slide, the carbs, like look at the vitamin water, 32 grams of carbohydrate per bottle. That's equal to having a whole sandwich, you know. So try to avoid, you know, uh, too much. Fruits are healthy, yes, but don't go for juices. Don't go for vitamin water or these kind of sweetened beverages. If you want to have fruit, have fresh fruit, you know, a smaller portion, not a big serving, though. Next slide. So briefly talking about the thyroid gland. So if you can see this picture of this uh, person's neck here, that's where your thyroid is. It's the pink colored fleshy uh, uh, organ in the center of the neck. Uh, it's a butterfly shaped gland and it's an extremely important organ uh, which produces important hormones which regulate the metabolism in your body. And it Almost every organ in the body has receptors for thyroid hormone. So if you develop a dysfunction of the thyroid hormone, uh, you know, it throws off the various metabolic processes in your body. Next slide. I wanted to just briefly talk about the most common thyroid problem, which is hypothyroidism. And that means your thyroid gland is not producing enough thyroid hormone to meet your body's needs. Uh, there could be different causes of it. Worldwide, the most common cause is deficiency of iodine, meaning the soil and the water in some countries does not have enough iodine, and your thyroid needs iodine as a raw material to produce thyroid hormones. In U.S., iodine deficiency is relatively uncommon, and if you're using iodized salt or if you take just one multivitamin a day, you are taking enough iodine to meet your uh, body's needs. In America and other developed countries, the most common cause of hypothyroidism is what's called Hashimoto's disease. So this is an autoimmune disorder which, in which your immune system makes these chemicals called antibodies, which cause an inflammation in your thyroid gland, which causes uh, you know, it to slow down. Another possible causes of hypothyroidism can be if you've had your thyroid removed surgically due to any reason or if you had an overactive thyroid, which was treated with radiation or what's called radioactive iodine, you may develop, uh, you may develop hypothyroidism due to that. Certain cardiac medications or heart medications can cause thyroid dysfunction. Uh, radiation treatment of your neck area can cause hypothyroidism and so forth. Next slide. So, this is just some general advice for people who have hypothyroidism. It's treated by giving a pill, which is a thyroid hormone supplement. And your, your doctor will give you the thyroid hormone supplement pill according to what level is needed in your body. So uh, make sure the, this, these medications come in like 15 different doses. So always make sure that your dose is correct when you pick up your refill from the pharmacy. 
try to, uh, if your doctor has recommended that you should be on a branded thyroid hormone pill, please make sure that your pharmacy is not substituting a generic for it because this is one medication where the brand is always better than the generic. Uh, make sure you're taking your medication on an empty stomach so that it's absorbed very well and with only a glass of water, not milk or anything. Uh, wait, it stays ideally an hour before you have breakfast or coffee or anything, but at least 40, 45 minutes before you eat something. Um, <laughs> and consistent diet. So if you make a big change in your diet, if you go from a low fiber diet to a high fiber diet, it can affect how much of your thyroid pill is absorbed. So it may affect your thyroid hormone levels. So any big changes in your diet, you might wanna have your thyroid levels checked again to see if your medication dose needs to be adjusted. If you take any kind of multivitamins or iron supplements or calcium tablets, you have to wait at least three hours after taking your thyroid pill before taking any of these medications because they, they will interfere with your thyroid pill getting absorbed in the body. Um, what else? Let's see. Antacids are another thing. They're rich in calcium. Make sure you're not taking it within two to three hours uh, of your thyroid medication uh, and so forth. Um, let's see. Uh, important thing is if it's a woman who has hypothyroidism, if you become pregnant, uh, your dose will need to be adjusted. And usually most pregnant women need at least a 25 to 30% dose increase during pregnancy. So always let your doctor know if you conceive or become pregnant because they'll need to adjust your dose of the thyroid medication. Uh, I believe that was uh, it. I know I wanted to devote most of the time to diabetes, but you know these were just some general thyroid tips that I wanted uh, everybody to know about. Uh, do we have any questions? Sai, do we, um, do we know if there's any questions? It doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat box right now, but if anyone has any questions, please do feel free to put them in I the believe, chat box. I believe somebody asked if they can unmute themselves to ask a question. Uh, do you want them to ask it by unmuting themselves or do you want them to type it in the chat box? Sure, if someone is more comfortable unmuting themselves, they absolutely can. Hi, Dr. Sonal. Uh, uh, can you hear me all right? Absolutely. Go ahead. Hi, hi. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much for spending the time. Thank you. Um, my name is Adi and, uh, uh, you know, I'm South Asian by descent. I have been living here and I have an IT job. Um, okay. Uh, so my question to you is that, you know, recently I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes. And mm -hmm. I, my HbA1c is at six. And uh, okay. so the uh, last time I went to the doctor, he said, you, it is at six. So I made lifestyle changes, uh, including diet control. Uh, I no. went from being, uh, 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 you know, a high carb diet to a low carb diet. And I've started mm -hmm. exercising. But this mm -hmm. time when I went to the doctor for my uh, uh, checkup, my blood glucose levels were still at six. Uh, I my triglycerides were also very high, were almost three hundred. Okay. Um, the doctor had given okay. me um, um, uh, fish oil, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, with my exercising, I brought that down to around hundred. But my HbA1c is still at six, and I'm really panicking because I'm only thirty-one right now, and I don't want to become a pre-diabetic. Uh, I obviously do have a family history of my parents being diabetic and so i just right, want to understand right. your your wisdom and your knowledge as to what additionally can be done in order to you know uh, just move completely away from it and fall down below the 5.6 mark uh sure so if you don't mind me asking i mean uh, i on a public forum sometimes it's uh, hard because i don't want to ask you private health questions, but are you, are you overweight? Is your body weight is in the ideal range? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm only 60, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 131 pounds. Now I was actually 145 around, 
and I okay. already lost around. So you lost some weight with. I uh, yes, that's yes, excellent. Yes, yeah, yeah, but but you know, right. I just want to bring that HPA one C level down and. Right. So when we talked about, you saw the slides about the diabetic diet. Were you following a diet which kind of, uh, you know, sounded like what I ex uh, recommended? Yes, yes. I moved from um, moved to whole grains from, uh, um, you know, processed and refined mm -hmm. grains, right. and I've 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 I'm using fruits that are low glycemic. Um, um okay. already, um, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm trying to reduce my food intake itself. Um, already, right. but yeah. So I just will it take. So right, I would I would probably just lower the. Uh, serving of fruit also because you know fruits do have carbohydrates for sure uh, so you know and if you're having whole grains that's great that's the healthier type of carbohydrate but your overall amount also matters so I don't know if you are you know a vegetarian because I know uh, a lot of Indian people are you know they they follow a vegetarian diet which makes it sometimes a little harder to go really low carb because you know your protein options are limited so uh, you know, definitely, I would think you you should ask your doctor to give you maybe a referral to see also a dietitian. And if despite your best efforts and you're following strict diet, then maybe, you know, another thing to consider would be uh, a medicine like metformin, which was studied in that study, the diabetes prevention program uh, research study that we talked about. Excellent. Thank you so much, doctor. I really appreciate your response. My pleasure. Are there any other questions? Let's see. So somebody's asking, are there any vitamins someone with hypothyroidism should avoid? Uh, not really. Uh, some people with hypothyroidism, they feel they go to this GNC or other kind of health supplement stores and they'll buy like kelp tablets. So kelp is a sort of seaweed, which is very, very high in iodine. Um, I always tell people who have any kind of, even general public, that you shouldn't be taking kelp supplements. So I would avoid that as a supplement. As far as vitamins go, just a general multivitamin is sufficient. Um, nothing that you should avoid per se. And let's see, um, another person is asking that they were diagnosed with Hashimoto's and their uh, TSH, T3, T4 levels are fine with medication, but they still feel symptoms. So uh, really, you know, the, the, the measure of how well your hypothyroidism is controlled is the TSH. Um, it's actually not even recommended to check T3 and T4 once you've already been diagnosed and taking thyroid hormone replacement. Uh, so TSH uh, if, should be maintained in the middle of the normal range between 0 0.5 to 3. Uh, as long as your TSH is being maintained in that range, uh, you know, if it's above that range, in the high normal range, you might want to speak to your doctor and see if they want to adjust your medication to get it more towards the middle of the normal range. That would be, uh, you know, something to consider. Uh, another thing would be to look for other causes of your symptoms, because once you have your TSH treated to target, uh, then you want to make sure that, you know, you don't have any other condition because symptoms, uh, the other question here is asking for symptoms of hypothyroidism. They are very, very nonspecific. Uh, most people with hypothyroidism that is mild may not feel any symptom at all. When you have a significant degree of hypothyroidism, you may feel uh, fatigue or tiredness. You may notice some weight gain. You may notice dry skin, hair loss, uh, some constipation, some mood cha changes. So if you think about it, these are such nonspecific things like feeling tired, uh, having dry skin, losing some hair can be due to so many causes, you know. So definitely one should treat you to target as far as your TSH is concerned. But once that is achieved, then I would also have your doctors look into possibly other causes of your symptoms. Okay, uh, let's see. For the general question about gaining weight, feeling tired and hair uh, loss, I would just have your doctor, you know, screen you for, uh, you know, making sure you don't have a thyroid condition, making sure you're not 
pre-diabetic, uh, cause all of those could be, you know, some of the things that can cause that. Uh, let's see. Thyroid nodules. Thyroid nodules are basically uh, lumps inside the thyroid gland. And they're also a very, very common finding more in women than men. Uh, they say about if you do uh, take a sample of general population and do ultrasounds on all of them, about 25 to 30% of all people may have some degree of lumps in their thyroid. So those lumps are called nodules, which can be either solid or they could be cystic, which means you know they're a thin walled cavity with some liquid inside it. Depending on the appearance of the nodules on the ultrasound, uh, you may be referred uh, for either a biopsy of the nodule or you might be advised to just have them followed by ultrasound. It's too general uh, of an advice to give because this is really case specific. And most people with thyroid nodules are referred to an endocrinologist like me. So, you know, if you have thyroid nodules, uh, definitely your primary care doctor uh, should probably refer you to a specialist. Let's see if there's any other. There's a question about MODI, which is a specific type of diabetes, which doesn't fall into the category of type one or type two. <clears throat> so this is something that uh, definitely is beyond the scope of today's talk. And uh, it's also beyond the scope of like a general internist. If you have been diagnosed with MODI, which is a maturity onset diabetes, um, which is not clearly a type one or type two diabetes, you should be seeing a specialist like an endocrinologist or a diabetologist. Uh, once medicine has been started for hypothyroidism, can we stop taking? Uh, most patients with hypothyroidism are on thyroid hormone replacement for life. And that's majority of them. There are sometimes some patients uh, who do come off medication, but that's a very small fraction of patients. Uh, I can't see the chat box anymore. Let's see. Okay, I think uh, morning sugars are a little high. Uh, again, specific questions about uh, individual cases should be uh, discussed with your doctor, or uh, if you're not seeing a specialist, maybe you know by your endocrinologist. I think we addressed uh, most of the questions here. Uh, uh, Ms. Rao, do you, um, are we pretty much done? As long as there's no other questions, I guess we can wrap things up. Um, thank you everyone so much for coming out this evening and thank you Dr. Pathak for having this wonderful educational presentation. Um, it was and my pleasure. A special thank you to the National Library of Medicine for giving us the grant that allowed us to do this presentation as well. All right. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. You guys too. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Patek. Thank you.